So Revelation chapter 4 and the rapture. We're looking at this evening. So, we'll pray and ask the Lord to minister to us. I was going to show this Wednesday night, but I forgot to announce it. Also, you know, Brian Jack are coming and Catherine Kennedy are coming. Maybe they would want to see it. Maybe not, but we'll see it. Um, so, Lord Jesus, this is your word. Holy Spirit, you are the one who speaks God's word to us, ministers to us. God's word, we ask that this evening, that's exactly what we would do. Reveal something to us, Lord, that we don't know. Remind us of something we do know. And give us something to apply into our lives tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we're going to look at some things that we've looked at recently. You know, the rapture, we looked at that. But, you know, I'm not going to go over it as extensively as I did last time. I'm just going to hit the points. But we're now, after looking at, you know, Revelation chapter 1, you know, a picture of Jesus. Revelation 2 and 3, seven letters to seven churches that we looked at over the last couple of months. And now we're looking at a scene in heaven. John, who wrote the book, is going to be whisked up into heaven. So it says in verse 1, of chapter 4 of Revelation. It says, after these things, so after these things, we talked about that last week, after these things, after the church age, after God is finished with the church, the church is us, after these things, I looked, and behold, the door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet, speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you things what must take place after these things. See, he's looking at the things that are, have been taking place and are taking place right now. Those things are going to take place after those things, after the rapture of the church, after the church age is over. You know, the, after these things, the word is meta taught -ta. After what? After church history. You know, I find it interesting that the first three chapters of this book, Revelation, the word church appears 19 times. From chapter 4 on, it never appears again. It doesn't appear. The word church, I mean, coincidence? Or are we really out of here? 19 times. And now it doesn't appear after this. Well, why? Because chapter 4, the church is, church is taken off the scene into heaven. It's gone. The trumpet. Come up here. Don't throw the same words that we will hear. The same words that we will hear. You know, one of the things that I feel is important about the rapture, why, I, why it matters to me, maybe why it matters to us, the timing of the rapture. Why would it be, for me personally, the importance of the rapture coming before the seven year tribulation? Because in, in the rapture also, not knowing exactly when it's going to come, because the seven year tribulation comes, you know where you stand in time. But if you don't know, it affects the way you live. If you think Jesus is coming back any minute, you, you will live differently. Mm -hmm. Maybe that sin that you were going to do, you know, oh, you know, oh, you know Jesus is coming back right now, I don't, maybe I won't do that. You know what I'm saying? That anticipation. See, there's this, I think due to misunderstanding that the debate goes on about the rapture when it happens. I think it's just misunderstanding it on the debate. You know, some say there's not a rapture. Some will tell you in churches, I mean, you, you probably go to the pretty much straight denominational churches, there's no rapture. That's, you know, we're not going to disappear. That's like a fairy tale stuff. I mean, there's a lot of churches. Actually, most of the churches believe that. Because they don't study their word. That's one. Some say post-tribulation. After the tribulation, the church will be taken up. Some say the middle of the tribulation, the church will be taken up. And then there's us. Calvary chapels and like-minded people like us that 
believe that it will happen before the tribulation. And one of the scriptures that's debated is in Matthew 24, verse 21 and 22. One of the de debated scriptures is this. It says, For there will be a great tribulation. That seven year tribulation. Such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And it's the word elect. But for the sake of the elect, they, they believe that the church is the elect that it's talking about. There are those who believe that the church has taken place of Israel. No, 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 no. You will hear that. There's a lot of churches that believe the church has taken the place of Israel because Israel crucified Jesus, the Jews. So we took their place. We did not take their place. Israel is God's chosen people. That's his wife. We are the bride of Christ. So they say, well, it's the elect. Well, we're going through it. Well, the elect in the Bible refers to three different groups. Christians in Ephesians 1, Israel in Isaiah 45, and those saved in the tribulation in Matthew 24, 21. So which does this reflect, okay? Well, in Matthew 24, 20, it says, when the Antichrist comes on the scene and the tribulation starts, it, it, you know, in the, he, in the middle of the tribulation, he comes in, he desiccates, creates the temple, you know, it says, but pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath. You see, the context of Matthew 24, he's talking to the Jews. He's not talking to the church. He's not talking to Gentiles. He's talking to the Jews. They are the elect in Matthew chapter 24. Okay, this is Israel. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't talk about the Sabbath. So we don't have, you know, we have church. We don't have the Sabbath day that we keep. Is Jesus is our Sabbath. So the context of that, that's, you know, there's more and more there. I don't want to get into that. Well, I want to go through all of chapter 4 tonight, okay? And then, in the, number 2, the trumpets. The trumpets is it something that's debated. In 1 Corinthians 15, 52, it says, In the moment, in a, not in the, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, where the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. We will be changed into those new glorified bodies, right? And guess what? We are with Him. That's the trumpet that is blown in Revelation chapter 4. Now, the people that believe we're going through tribulation, or even the mid-tribulation, they, they look at Revelation chapter 11, the seventh or last trump signaling the rapture. Uh, they say it will take place midway through the tribulation. But that trumpet, remember we looked at that before, was sounded by angels. This trumpet is blown by God. This one, the rapture one, is blown by God, the last trump, his trump, not the angels. We, we've looked at that, okay? 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, that's Jesus, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And as I've shared with you so many times, it's comfort to me to know that I'm going to hear the trumpet and I'm going to be with him and I'm not going to not have to go through the tribulation and I'm not even going to have to die a physical death. That's comforting. It's not comforting if you tell me, you're going to go through the tribulation. Is that comforting? Is it comforting to go through the tribulation and maybe see five billion people killed? That's not comforting. Hailstones, 100 pound hailstones falling down, the sun disappearing, all the water turning to blood. I mean, no, none of that's comforting to me. But it is comforting. In 1 Thessalonians 4.18. Nothing's comforting to me but a pre-tribulation rapture. Nothing. Now, also, the tribulation is the outpouring of the wrath of God, of the wrath of the Lamb. 
if God has not appointed us to wrath. That says that in Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11. It says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. He took our wrath on the cross. So His wrath isn't going to be poured on us. He took it on the cross. You know, another thing is the rapture before the tribulation was demonstrated in Genesis 18 when the angels delivered Lot before Sodom. It was illustrated when Enoch was no more, just taken. Woo! Gone. The rapture before tribulation was illustrated in Daniel when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were there and, and they were in the fire and, and Daniel wasn't there with them. He was gone. Where was their friend Daniel? Taken out of the scene. And then Jesus said in Luke 21, 36, But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all the things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things, that you come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That's the King James Version. The other one was New, New American Standard. And then also, historically and scripturally, it just makes sense. You know, we look at the wedding, the seven-year wedding, and you know, all, all those things. It, it just make, makes sense uh, for us to be up there with Jesus for seven years during our honeymoon with him while the tribulation is going on down here. And then an eighth thing, I'm looking at 13 things, by the way. And the eighth one is the pre-tribulation follows the outline of the book of Revelation. You would have to put chapters 4 and 5 after chapter 11 if you believed in the mid-tribulation. So 4 and 5 would have to be after chapter 11. It just, it's out of sync, time-wise, in the book of Revelation. And you'd have to put it after chapter 19 if you believe in a post-tribulation. You know, after the tribulation rapture, you'd have to put it after chapter 19. Because you see the church in chapters 4 and 5, you see the church in 19. So it would have to be it have to be after this. So, and, and the ninth thing is Revelation 2.22. The conditional aspect of the tribulation that you can escape it. It says, Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into the great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. So you repent you become a Christian, you will escape the tribulation. Jesus said we would have tribulation, but it's not from God. And the pre-tribulation rapture allows for the unknown time of the Lord's return. We would know the days coming back when the tribulation starts. We know it will be 1200, 1260 days. You can count. That's the day Jesus will come back. When, when that treaty is signed in the Middle East. And the eleventh thing is, the tribulation is unnecessary for the church. It's unnecessary. It's referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble in the Old Testament. That's, it's, it's for Israel. <laughs> it's to get their attention. <laughs> it's to save them all in one day. Deuteronomy 4.29 says, But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find Him if you will search for Him, and with all your heart and all your soul when you are in distress, and all these things have come upon you. In the latter days you will return to the Lord your God and listen to His voice. Because of the things you're going to go through, they will return to Him. And that's a promise for the Jews, not for us. And He's going to fulfill that promise to them. And then the twelfth thing that I have the pre-tribulation rapture squares with the prophecy of Daniel. 70, 70 weeks of Daniel, 69 have been done. There's one week left in it. You know, there's a whole study of that. We've looked at that a little more in depth before. Uh, and then the last one is the pre-tribulation view causes us to seek the kingdom of God. It causes us. Lord, I'm looking after you. I'm looking for your return. I'm looking 
to you. So that we watch that we're ready for his coming. So that's what I believe happens. Personally, I believe. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Soup. And John is immediately, it says in verse 2, immediately, Revelation chapter 4, verse 2, immediately I was in the Spirit. He heard the trumpet and immediately he was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. He, he went right there. He's right in heaven now. He's, he's in heaven, in the Spirit. John, he was on the island of Patmos. Now he's in eternity with this vision. After he hears the trumpet of God. And I think that's with us too. Zoop! Well, he's going to come back. We're not. But now he's there now. You know, he, he, when he wrote that, he's going to come back. In the Spirit, you see... The bodies, our bodies will be changed because these bodies can't go there. We're going to have spiritual bodies. These bodies of flesh, what we've been waiting for, well, these bodies of flesh will be gone and our bodies will be transformed into this spiritual body like Jesus had, like he did, so that he could go up there and be around the throne. And, there, and then the throne is standing there. The throne can't be moved. And nobody carries it. And we will be there with him, worshiping around him. In chapter 5, if you look ahead, you'll see that the one sitting on the throne is the Father. And Jesus approaches him to get the scroll. So that's who's sitting on this throne. So then in verse 3, it says, And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. The jasper stone is probably a clear stone like a diamond. Now, in my mind, jasper is different. I, I was a stone cutter. I was a jeweler for 19 years. I cut stones. And the jasper was a different kind of a stone. It was usually a solid stone. And, and you know, sometimes I picture jaspers. I had all these beautiful jaspers. Like jasper was my favorite stone. But this one here is talking about a different kind. It's talking more like a diamond, like clear, crystal clear, brilliant, bright. Uh, and it's, it, it speaks of light, this jasper stone. It speaks of light because God is light. In the high priest, the first stone on his vest was a jasper stone. You know, he, he had his vest, and the first stone on it was jasper. It represented the tribe of Reuben, whose name meant, Behold, a son. That was the first stone. And then the second stone that we see here, like a jasper stone, and a sardius, and a sardius in appearance. The sardius stone is like a ruby. Red, which of course represents the red blood of Jesus. That was the second stone that you see there. And on the high priest's vest, that stone was there. In the high priest's vest, it was for Benjamin. It represented Benjamin, and Benjamin's name meant son of my right hand. Then Thirdly, we see there a rainbow. A rainbow. Because God is a covenant-keeping God. He said with the rainbow, He would not flood the worldwide flood of the world again. And He hasn't done it, and He won't do that. It's a sign of grace, the rainbow around that throne. And we are invited to come boldly to the throne of grace. Hebrews 4, verse 16. This rainbow is circular, not like ours, which are cut in half and only just half. It's just a circular rainbow around the throne. And it says, like an emerald in appearance. An emerald, emerald green, representing the eternal nature of Christ. The eternal nature of Him. And you wonder, where is Jesus? Isn't he seated at the right hand of his Father? Hebrews 1.3 says, And he is the radiance of his glory, and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds everything by the word of his power. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. 
That's where he is. He's at it right now. Revelation 3.21, He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. So Jesus is there on his throne. I believe. And you know, I know for one thing that Jesus leaves his throne twice in heaven. Once for the rapture, and the second time for his second coming. So we know that he leaves it twice. Now, in this study, we notice that there are seven things around the throne of God. There's, number one, the triune God. There's the 24 elders. There are the signs of judgment. There's the seven spirits of God. Okay, I'm going to get it right I'll slow down a little bit. There's the sea of glass. There's the four living creatures. And there's heavenly worship of Christ. And in verse 4, we see, we, we see the tree, tree we pray in God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit around the throne. And then we see in verse 4 here, around the throne were, you know, how do I know that? Because it says around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. 24 thrones. You know, the Old Testament priesthood was divided into 24 groups. That's in 1 Chronicles 24. And then the church is called the kingdom of priests. Revelation 1, verse 6. And then you have elders. Elders represent man. Elders represent the church. When you look at the scripture here, and you look up in the Greek, it's out, it's man or angels. I believe it's men, representing men, sitting on these 24 thrones. Possibility, the 24 elders could, could refer to the 12 patriarchs. You know, that's the kids, the 12 kids. And the twelve apostles. It could be that. Okay. You know, there, there's going to be twelve gates in the New Jerusalem, and the name of one of the patriarchs is on is on each of the foundations. Is or, or on, a, on each of the gates is the name of the patriarchs, and on the foundation is the name of the apostles. Okay. Revelation 21. So if this is the case, 24 elders would represent and symbolize God's people, Old Testament believers and New Testament believers. They are in God's presence, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's what I believe that it represents, the church and the Old Testament. You know, elder means leader, chapter 5, verse 9. The elders had been redeemed by the blood. That's, that's in uh, Revelation 5 9. With your blood you purchased for God ev from every tribe and every language and people and nation. Now, only the church is promised thrones that I've seen in the Word. Only the church has been promised thrones. Okay? Matthew 19 28. So Jesus said to them, Assuredly I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Revelation 3.21 He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Just things that I've, I've seen in the Word. Then, you, then they're clothed in white robes, which is, what is the white robes? What represent? The righteous acts of the saints. And they're clothed in these white robes. So why do I believe it represents the church? Why do I believe that we're there? Because there we are. Representing us on those thrones. And we're all around there. I believe. At this time. Wearing gold crowns. Promised to the church. Crowns. Has this judgment seat of Christ happened? Have the rewards already been given out? Probably so. The rewards are already given. So then in verse 
5, it says then, Out of from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. You know, we sing that Revelation song, you know? That's right. You know, I don't know if you guys ever noticed, when, we, when we're doing that song, when that part comes up, we take the music and just go, boom! Like the lightning and the thunder. That's how I feel it when we play it. Just keep the music, boom! And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Wow. You see, a storm is coming, man. You know, when we're here, you, you're there and out there. You know, my, my dog's here waiting for I do. When my dogs run in and they go, I know it's coming. I can't hear it yet, but they know it. They, they know it. And, they're, and I go, oh, a storm is coming. And then it gets closer and the keys start running. <laughs> Four talks. And the lightning. The storm is coming. And then in verse 6, and before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center of the <laughs> Hallelujah, brother. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. All right. Before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. Whoa. You know, the sea of glass. You look at that. Well, what is that? You know what? Here's kind of what I believe this is. I believe it's, it's something very peaceful. I believe it's, it is the church raptured in eternity at rest. The sea of glass. We're just calm. We're in front of the throne. There we are. And the storm's coming. And there's peace, the word of God. And then you have the four living creatures. Whoa. Look at that. And in the center around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. You know what the four living creatures representing? You know what they represent? The four gospels. The cherubim. You first they're first seen in the Garden of Eden. It says, so he drove man out in Genesis 3.24. So he drove the man out in the east of the Garden of Eden, stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. In the book of Exodus, cherubim are again seen, seen on the mercy seat. They are also in the book of Ezekiel chapter 1. Let's just look at that. Ezekiel chapter 1. Look, well, let's look at the description of them in Ezekiel chapter 1. And then we'll look at the description of them. Description in verse 7 of Revelation 4. I've been thinking about doing the, the study of Ezekiel because it's such a great book. We started one time and we never got around to do a little bit of it. Now the heading on my Bible says, the vision of the four figures. So down to verse 4 in Ezekiel chapter 1 says, and as I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually, and a bright light around it in the midst, something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. It kind of, you know, when you get back to work from Revelation 4, you see the same thing, the thunder and the lightning and all that. And here's what you kind of see here. It says, within it, there were figures represent, resembling four living beings. And this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet were like calves' hooves. And they, they gleamed like burnished bronze. Under the wings, on their, on, on their four sides were human hands, as for the faces and the wings of four of them. Their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. As for the form of their faces, each one had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right, and the face of the bull on the left. And they, faced, they had the, the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above, each had two touching another being. 
the two covering their bodies, and each went straight forward, whether the spirit was going to go, they would go, without turning as they went. In the midst of the living beings, there was something like, looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright, and the lightning was flashing from the fire, and the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. Now as I looked at the living beings, behold, there was one wheel on the earth beside the living beings for each of the four of them. The appearance of the wheels and their workmanship was like sparkling barrel, and all four of them had the same form, their appearance and workmanship being as if one wheel were within another. Where they moved, they moved in any of their four directions without turning as they moved. As for the rims, they were lofty and awesome, and the rims of the four of them were full of eyes round about. <laughs> When other living beings moved, the wheels moved with them. And whenever the living beings rose from the earth, the wheels rose with them also. Wherever the Spirit was about to go, they would go in the direction. And the wheels rose close behind them, for the Spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. And so on. I mean, wow. These things were like, so, but you know, there was faces on four sides, and there was eyes in the wheels. And I mean, wow. I can't wait to see one of these things. <laughs> We are going to see them. This isn't, you know, fantasy land. Now, we have to remember, he described it in the only terms he could tell. I mean, so who knows, you know? Well, back to Revelation chapter 4, verse 7, it says, it talks about the creature. It says, the first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. The four faces of these cherubim, listen, they correspond to the four Gospels. The Lion. Matthew presents Jesus as the King, the Lion from the tribe of Judah, doesn't he? In Mark, the calf, or ox, representing servitude. Then you have Luke, Jesus in his humanity, the face of man. And then the eagle, deity. The eagle soars higher than any other creature, but is the only animal able to look into the sun as Jesus looks into the eyes of the Father. The four creatures represent the four Gospels. I think that's pretty interesting when you look at that. In chapters 1 and 2 of the book of Numbers, God declares that his people were to camp in a certain order. He wanted his people, when they camped, to camp in a certain order. Listen, listen to how he had them camp, okay? This is when they were traveling in the wilderness. He told the Levites to surround the tabernacle on the north, south, east, and west sides. Okay? Well, why? Well, to be close to the glory of God, because, you know, the tabernacle is where the glory of God was. And, they, and that way, they, they would always be close to the Lord in, in their service, okay? Now, in Numbers chapter 2, on each of the four sides were the tribes of Israel, okay? Judah, the lion, was on the east side because Jesus comes back roaring with authority and he comes back from the east. Ephraim, the ox, was on the west side. Reuben, humanity, they were on the south side, and Dan, and the eagle, was on the north side. Now, listen to this. The largest number of people camped on the east, the smallest number on the west, and almost the identical number of people on the north and the south, and the configuration is that of a cross. Most of the people, less. So they, they, when they camped, if you will, in space and the satellite, you kind of go, who is a cross? Where they can. You know what? I, you, you can't make that stuff up. I, how do you make that up? I mean, the, the Bible is truth. You know? You know why would, I mean, why would even God think that? Why would he even do that? But you know, it, it's all, he's all, Jesus is all over the Old, and stuff like this, all over the Old Testament. Everywhere. Now, I didn't figure that out. I got that from somebody else. I go, these people that figure this stuff out, I was like, wow. Well, in verse 8 of Revelation 
chapter 4. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord throughout eternity. You see, remember in Isaiah 6, what were they saying? Holy, holy, holy. You know when Isaiah was there. Why are we saying we sing those songs? We're just joining them in eternity. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I you know what they sing that one. That tune up there. Here they have these six wings. The six wings. Non stopping activity. Worshiping the Lord at all times. You know, the wings just go, man. Always worshiping the Lord. Full of eyes within. You know, Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. Holy, holy, holy. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Why is there three holies? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy. You know what I'm saying? These creatures are overwhelmed with the holiness of God, these angels. These cherubim. Around the throne. All the time. Just worshiping the Lord. Don't you just want to do that? <clears throat> Never be bored. Just worship the Lord. What an activity. Just worship the Lord. And be fulfilled the whole time you do it. Man. While continuing on in verse 9 and 10. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne. We fall down, we lay our crowns. That's where that song comes from. The crowns, cast before the throne. The crowns. Who gets crowns? The church. That's the rewards of, of the church that Jesus gives for the things that we've done this Listen, there's the crown of righteousness. I'm going to name There's five rewards. The crown of righteousness is given to those who love his appearing. 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 That's my King James English of appearing. 2 Timothy 4 8. The crown of righteousness. You want to see it? I, think I named that crown. I, I did this study on the, the rewards, the crowns. You know, and I, I named this one the want to see him crown. You want to see him? It's the want to see him crown. You get a crown because you want to see Jesus. You're waiting for his return. You want to be with him. He rewards you for that. Number two, the crown of life is given to those who love him. James 1 12. You love him? You get a crown on him. You get a reward just for loving him. How could you not love him? Look what he did for you. The crown of glory is given for servanthood. 1 Peter 5, 9. Serving him. The crown of glory. Just keep plugging along. Ministry for the Lord. Keep putting those words up there. Keep doing that. Keep doing it. Your exaltation. Keep doing it. With your children. Take care of your kids. Ministry. Keep doing your worship. Keep doing it. It's your crown. And then, the soul winner's crown. Winning souls for Christ is given to those who share their faith. 1 Thessalonians 2.19. Get a crown. We're going out and sharing the gospel with people. Sharing the love of Christ with people. He rewards you for that. And then in Revelation 2.10, the martyr's crown for those who lay down their lives. Which also means dying to self. Because you know, when you die to self, that's a death. When you give up those things you give up and the, the, the things you want to do and, the thing, and doing things you don't want to do, that's dying to self. Mm -hmm. The crown. You know, Paul tells us in I think it's 1 Corinthians 9 24, to run the race so that we, we may win the prize. Run the race. Keep on trucking. 1980s, 70s term, something. 
And then, the last verse for this evening. Verse 11 of Revelation chapter 4. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and they were created. Thou art worthy to receive glory. We sing that song too, don't we? We sing a lot of songs out of the Word. You know, worship is important for heaven. It is the programming of it. We will be worshiping around the throne. We will be worshiping our Lord. We will see God face to face. But at the same time, the kingdom of God is here. And you can, you can do now what you will do then. You can worship Him in your life now and enter into eternity and be a part of the kingdom of God right here on earth. And sometimes you don't feel like it, but you can do it anyhow. Struggles of life got you down. You can do it. You can worship Him and, and enter into eternity. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. As you look at it, it's, it's, I mean, how many times you know if you worship God when you didn't feel like it, you're going through things, and then all of a sudden you forgot about that stuff. And there's this that, that time in there where it's like, oh, you forgot about it. It's still there. And you come back around to reality. You're like, whoa. But wow, you just you have the peace of God because you worship Him. You can bring heaven into your life by worship, worshiping the Lord. You know, the, the, the New Testament word for worship is proskuneo, and it means to kiss towards, like a dog. A dog, like Capito. We come here. Gone now. We come here, and that dog just loves Miss Anna. Just licks her up. Just loves her. It's that is what we're talking about. You know the dog that you beat, and then he comes up and licks your hands? That's what it's talking about. Mm -hmm. That kind of love. To kiss towards. It's intimate worship. To be in His presence. To worship Him. For He is God. And there we are in heaven. Singing it. We're singing it now. We're going to sing that song right now. I'm going to pick my guitar. We're going to sing Thou Art Worthy. But. We're going to sing the eternity too. Because that's it. They're singing it right there. We're going to be there. We're going to be there when that happens. So let's join them now. Let's stand up.
saints in heaven and eternity just to worship you, Lord. Thank you again for your word, Father. Thank you for the promises of our future with you in eternity. Thank you for saving us. And once again, Lord, we pray that you use us while we are here to share the gospel. So we lay even our hearts down tonight, our lives down, Lord. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit and go before us. And thank you for being here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.